guys, Oral Sessions, The Sessions, with Impact Wrestling's Tom Hannafan. How are you? I'm alive. <laughs> I'm how, alive. Like, how do you feel right now? How crazy was it to just be thrown right into the mix like that? I mean, like you and I have seen it over the years where they want to debut either like an in-ring talent or an announcer on a pay-per-view. And it's like on paper, it's like, oh, that sounds super cool. And it's like, no, in reality, it's like really nerve. Like I was nervous as hell you coming into tell. this weekend. I couldn't oh, hear it. Thank you. Um, it was it was a lot of fun uh, working with D'Lo was a breeze. So it was just I don't know. I hadn't called a wrestling match in like six months. Oh so I hadn't God. done something the caliber of a pay-per-view since March. So I was like, oh, OK, like this is this is different. But like once I got into it, it was so much fun. The crowd was hot. It was awesome. The crowd was super into everything. It was yeah. a very busy pay-per-view for you to jump in and call and also for you to be doing it in a two-man booth. I know you're familiar with working two-man booths, obviously, but that just puts like more pressure on like, you got to you got to talk. You got to fill that space. Were you honestly, feeling that? I honestly always preferred two man booths. Like I had to be diplomatic at points and be like, I don't know, three men are fine. I always preferred two men. Uh, when yeah. Graves and I got to do our thing in NXT, um, that was so much fun just because like he's one of my longtime friends and close friends. So it was really easy and we just were, um, you know, oil and water. So that was fun. But like yeah. I prefer the two man. And then very quickly I realized I was like, OK, yeah, D'Lo is really good like i i think he's underrated unfortunately which uh is a shame but he well, that's was good you can awesome. let him shine now time to boost the guy up and uh, give yeah. him a little spotlight <laughs> i don't know if you needed any boosting but he was awesome and uh you, you know how it can be like when you're you were in a three man at one point and it's like that third person can either become the third oh, wheel or yes. somebody disappears you know so it was it's cool. Rough. Then, it, yeah it's really yeah. hard to find your footing in a three-man booth i mean i definitely had a hard time trying to find my spot especially by the time graves and cole would give me a space to talk i'm like well shit y'all already said everything <laughs> well and then we had uh ian riccaboni on for the ring of honor yeah. world title match and listen i'm not going to sit here and pretend that i know every last thing about ring of honor and pure rules so um first of all ian's a philly guy so it was like awesome i was like genuinely wanted to work with him and it's literally my first night out i get to do that so that was sick um but i told him i was like dude this is your company this is your match so like i'll be there to drop in a few things here and there and he and d-lo just ran it was so much fun it was easy yeah like okay so let's just roll it back quickly when did you know that you were going to be joining impact and like what was sort of the conversation that all went into putting everything in place for this to happen it's only really developed within the last month. Um, you know, I, lo I love how people on the internet try and come up with, you know, concepts and rumors and stuff like that. Oh, but, brother. Um, it, you know, I have a lot of friends here and kind of connected me with the, the powers that be and just had some good conversations. And honestly, the, the schedule was very attractive because, as you know, like I just got done doing a 52 week a year schedule for mm -hmm. about nine years. So I was like, this is great. This is really cool. And everything that I was told about what the locker room is like an impact, what Scott Demore and Josh Matthews and everything, like everything's been accurate thus far. And I worked one day, but everybody's been awesome. So, <laughs> so it far, was so cool. Good. Yeah. Like, and, and you know, how it is like when you know a whole bunch of people there and like just showing up yesterday and seeing Matt Raywald and him, like being like, what the hell are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> so it was really cool. Okay. Uh, it's, I mean, God, there's so many different things that I want to ask you about. So I don't even know if you can talk about this, but I'm going to ask you about it. But did you not have a 12 month non-compete with WWE? What happened? What happened there? I don't want to get talk into about that. I, I can't get into that. I don't want to get okay. into specifics, but I, I do want to thank WWE for a number of reasons. Obviously I wouldn't be in this position to contribute to another promotion if it weren't for WWE and especially nine years of yeah. training and learning. Like the big thing I was sitting there yesterday was I, I was talking to the, the good brothers at one point and I was like, man, I got, I got hired at 23. So that world was all that I've ever known. So it's a lot of the same things, but it's still breaking some habits here and there and changing a few things and then just being me. So it's just a very, very different circumstance. But how, again, I wouldn't how, be here without WWE. How hard is it to, and this is like, sounds like a stupid question, but I know that it's not. How hard is it to just be you right now? I mean, after having gone through, you know, being the broadcaster of Tom Phillips for the last eight, nine years, 
to now being Tom Hannafin. I mean, I know you've been doing your podcast and whatnot as well. So that definitely helps to kind of shake some things off and get back to you as a broadcaster. But were you feeling that a little bit of like, wait, who am I again as a broadcaster? I mean, yeah, like you go from the the pressure being, you know, for, for a number of different reasons in terms of the way that WWE produces their shows, but like all of a sudden it's like, okay, like it's, it's all on you. It's, it's yeah. largely, it's largely your show. I was given a lot of faith to go out there and do what we did with D'Lo. So um, yeah, it was, it was nerve wracking. Cause I'm like, oh, this is what I did. And then as you remember from WWE, there's certain ways that they like things done and things said and not said and all of a sudden I can say certain things that I wasn't able to say and I was like this is really cool like I, I think I said it on the countdown to hard to kill we we couldn't refer to bullet club obviously for trademark reasons and yeah. we always danced around it and we said the club so I was like oh I can say bullet club on the air <laughs> I can say pro wrestling and it's just little like trademark things and branding mm -hmm. things that WWE likes to do and that's fine but there are just so many little changes here. But it's just it's so this, ingrained yeah. in your brain because I catch yeah. myself still. I mean, I yeah, I mean, I, I still find myself doing things. I'm like, oh my God, that's so ingrained in my head to say certain things, especially, you know, when I'm doing this podcast and I have on people from WWE or from other promotions. And yeah, I'll catch myself just uh I can like still hear Vince in my head. And it's hard to it's hard to shake that or like have coal in my head, you know. So the strangest thing was obviously the news broke about Mickey James being in the Royal Rumble the day before. Mm -hmm. And it, and I realized I was like, I, the former Tom will be on an impact pay-per-view promoting a <laughs> WWE pay-per-view match with yeah. the impact knockouts world champion, Mickey James. I was like, am I being punked? Like I what know. is happening right now? It Total was pretty weird. Bizarro world. I was thinking about that. Yeah. Cause you, I think it was just, you know, on your, your cell out of the pay-per-view was to make sure to check out Mickey James at the Royal Rumble as a main event. A yeah, that must have been deal. like such it's a huge deal. It's a huge deal. So what do you think about? I mean, everyone, you know, uses the term the forbidden door, but in terms to it being open in this sense for Mickey James to, you know, essentially have gone through the things that she went through being released by WWE now kicking ass with impact with NWA to now her being able to go and participate in something like the Royal Rumble. It's awesome. I think it's two things. One, we all know how good Mickey James is and what a pro she is. Mm -hmm. So obviously getting somebody like her for the Royal Rumble match makes all the sense in the world. Somebody reliable when you're putting together a match of that uh, ilk, it's huge. So you need a lot of smart people in the ring and Mickey James is that. Mm -hmm. um, and then it also speaks to the way Impact does business. Um, I think Scott Demore put something out there that how Impact has worked with WWE, AEW, AAA, New Japan, ring of honor, like the list goes on and on. And it's just, they're open for business. And so the forbidden door is, is pretty wild. I, I don't really know how to describe it. Like we're living in bizarro world, professional wrestling in 2022 already. Yeah. Do you think that we're going to see more and more of that in WWE? I mean, now that there has been such mass releases and the roster has really been thinned out, are there going to be more and more moments like this when you get to see other people from other promotions going back to WWE or maybe just having a moment on WWE if they've never been there before? It depends. And, and like, you know, it's like moments like the Royal Rumble are the perfect opportunity for right. those things. So I wouldn't be shocked if we got some more surprises by the end of this month and we'll, we'll see what happens there. But yeah, it's stop all announcing them, by the way. God, I hate that. What? When they announce who's in the Rumble, the Royal Rumble is my favorite pay-per-view. Oh, you want to be time. surprised by all yes, of them? Yes. Uh, yes. I were want you mad surprise. that Summer Rae got announced? Yes. <laughs> okay. So like. <laughs> <laughs> of all of the people announced, I mean, even Mickey James, that one's a huge one. I mean, if she right. came That's out headlines. and her music hit, I would have been like, holy shit. But Summer has not been a part of any WWE event since she left. So to hear her music hit would have thrown me for an absolute loop. And I think a lot of people would have felt the same way. So I, I'm kind of bummed that they're announcing all of these. I, I'm Let with you. I, I, I like I like to be surprised. Like like we talk about Edge returning at the Rumble a couple of years ago, and it was like everybody's mind was blown. You don't have oh those God. moments all the time, but still yeah. to get those instances where like you feel like a kid again, and you're just transported yeah. to uh, that moment when that person was really really lighting the world on fire, and just to have them back for a few minutes, it's amazing. It's it's really cool. It's really like yeah, like guys, I don't want to I don't want to not believe in Santa Claus yet. Like let's <laughs> keep the dream alive. 
keep it going. I can't wait to watch that though, but I, I'm very excited for that. And I'm especially excited for Mickey James. Um, her and Deanna Perrazzo absolutely crushed it last night in the main Killed event. Um, really, really cool. How weird is it for you um, as a broadcaster now having to relearn people's names and call them different names? Oh my God. I saw Matt Cardona uh, right as I was walking in the building. And I was I'll like, never you know, call him Matt Cardona. Never. And I was I like, can't. I said to him, I was like, you're the bane of my existence because for <laughs> about nine years, I'd called you Zack Ryder and it was the broski boot and it was the rough rider. And then in one night I had to change all of that. And he was like, yep, changed everything. I was like, thanks, bud. <laughs> so it's a um, lot. And that, that's a lot of guys. Uh, Jonah is a close friend. Steve Macklin is a close friend. So it's like, OK, I've got to relearn all this stuff. Um, it, it was just weird. And then even saying the championships impact knockouts world champion, and then just undoing some things that were WWE isms that is like, Oh, I don't have to hit this or that or whatever. So it, it's, I don't know. I'm still learning. And like, I, we've got the taping later tonight, this, the day we're recording this. So I'm like, oh, okay, we'll see what else happens tonight. Well, it's kind of nice to do it back to back, right? So that you can yeah. just kind of stick with it. And it is, it's a learning curve when your brain is trained one way for so long, you don't just switch it. It takes a second, especially when you're in like the heat of the moment and a bunch of stuff is happening and you're watching your monitor and trying to just like, like Oh my God, what's your name again? How do I not screw <laughs> this up? I remember I used to always do that when I was calling to Nina's matches. I always called her Serona. Oh, always. Yeah. I'm like, ah, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I remember doing something on the WWE app for all you crazy kids out there that remember that. <laughs> and I was interviewing Perfect. Cesaro and I called him Claudio and he just Claudio leans in and he just leans in. He's like, Hey, fave. And he walks out of the screen. <laughs> and I was like, I'm definitely fired. I'm absolutely fired. <laughs> I will. I do it. Yeah, I definitely do it to him as well. And I, I always had a hard time calling Christian Christian when we were doing backstage. I was just wanted to call him Jay. Yeah. These things throw me. Uh, yeah. Throw you for such a loop. Um, OK, so you're at impact. Everything is great. What else is going on in your life? You have like you've just what a crazy like year. You didn't you just lose 30 pounds? Tell me about that. <laughs> so you look great. Thank you. Um, so whatever tanner you were wearing on the pay-per-view. So much great, makeup. By thank the you way. to thank really you to nice. Caroline in the impact makeup department. She Shout made out me, to she made me tan. Thank you, Caroline. It was nice. Oh, yeah, it was nice. Um, no, so like when the pandemic first hit. It was June 2020 and like I stepped on the scale and I was like, this is more of a person than I should be like, this is not <laughs> it's a lot more man because everybody like everybody. I think we all thought it was going to be over in a couple of weeks. And I was like, great, I'll just Uber Eats to the other side. And August of that year, I really started committing to like, all right, I'm going to drop some weight and, and get in shape. So I, I lost like 30 pounds. Wow. And now what I'm just do. Uh, I was walking a ton. I was going to the gym regularly. Like I was just being lazy for years. Like I remember Michael Cole told me when I uh, started on the road, he was like, you're going to get fat. And I was like, no, I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm skinny. I got a great metabolism. I'm young. And he was like, you're going to drink. You're going to eat bad food on the road. You're going to get fat. And he was right. Uh, about a lot of things literally in life. Yeah. everybody like it's it's really hard to avoid. Also, when you're just walking through catering. You know, like oh. catering and those snacks, if you're like a little bit bored during the day and there's those mm. beautiful, giant, crispy cookies laid out. So many cookies, so many know. chocolate chip and oatmeal raising so cookies. Good. Just, oh, God, so it was good. so good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's been it's been really good for me. It's been good for my mental health. I know everybody talks about mental health, but um, yeah, like it, it's been a roller coaster past year for me and I won't get into too much, but like. Um, I mean, we know, like to get into things here. Tom, I know if you I don't know. want to. You have no, my blessing. There's, there's a there's a lot of stuff, uh, you know, in, in my personal life that has mm -hmm. changed. And in terms of obviously leaving WWE, like, as I mentioned, this is all that I knew for, for nine years. So, yeah, um, I was heartbroken when that happened. So a lot happened in a very short span. And if anything that this past year has taught me is that, um, you know, it's the old cliche that good things come to an end and that's OK. And it took me a long time to be okay with that. And uh, mm, I, I know the feeling, dude. Like I, I know that feeling, and it it does it does take a minute. Yeah. To really, I, it, it's heartbreaking. That's I mean, that's a perfect way to put it. It breaks your heart. Um, you know, even though like you know when I left and I left the way that I wanted to leave, it still broke my heart. Didn't not. Oh my god! Speaking of speaking of getting watery eyed, when you <laughs> left, I was don't like, "Don't think I wasn't going to bring like, that up." <laughs> oh, I hate you so much. I was like, 
oh, Renee's leaving. I'm like, oh, that sucks. And then when I see you the day that SummerSlam, I'm like, I just start crying. And I was like, what in the world? <laughs> and then Dustin Wallace uh, is there shooting it. He's like, don't worry, Tom. I got all of that. <laughs> Such a bastard. Damn you, Dustin. I mean, it was, yeah, you cried when I left and, and Booker cried. You were the only two Booker that cried. cried. Oh, actually, Graves cried too. Yeah, Graves cried like away from everybody, but he shed some tears. He's a marshmallow. <laughs> he really is. Uh, no, like I, I've said this a million times on a bunch of different platforms, but like when I first started, I had next to no experience in in television like i again i was 23 years old i never used a prompter i'd never worked in a studio so they put me with you in stanford and you literally held me by the hand and took me through stuff so you and i you know experienced everything together and it's not Did. like we were like hanging out in bars every single night or something like that whatever with oh, all I mean, the guys we had but those like, nights we, we had plenty of those nights. nights what was the one in indianapolis where you and lita sung prince um the wild saw, beaver you know saloon so funny that for some reason, when I'm like scrolling through my phone, if I'm like trying to it's like someone's birthday or something, I'm like, I need right. to find a picture with this person. I come across those videos all the time and I get that like that cringy feeling of like, what the f were we thinking? Trying to go up and sing, let's go crazy to a bunch of 19, 20 year olds that had not a clue. Well, I guess it would have been 21. We're not in Canada anymore. We were all boozing. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, nobody knew the song. Nobody liked it, but we stuck to our guns. We really tried to see it through to the end. Terrible. I respected it because Prince had just passed. So you and yeah. Lita were like, we absolutely have to pay homage to him. And you did. Uh, and that place, uh, I think <laughs> oh, it was, I, I, I believe it was called the Wild Beaver Saloon. Like the, the sign outside was hilarious. And I'm just standing there taking pictures and photos for you. And I was like, this is not going well, but it's hilarious. <laughs> it was not going. It was not our best showing, but we really we we saw the performance through to maybe not the end, but at least three quarters of the way through. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we definitely had those times. You and I really did. Like we started really close together, maybe within a couple of weeks of each other, maybe even I think. days. I, like, I don't know what it was. It was very close though. Um, but it is really funny to look back on like sort of like those reflective moments of, yeah, I had more television experience at that time. So I was able to guide you through the studio stuff and reading off of a teleprompter and, you know, even being down at NXT together when we could, you know, kind of let loose and do our own thing and, and find out who we were in the scheme of WWE, what we sounded like, all that stuff. But on the other side, when I started doing commentary, I mean, damn, you really like took me by the strong arm and like you did your best <laughs> to help me in a situation where I was like, somebody help me. But you were great. I mean, you would always like text me during the shows. You would give me updates on things. Um, and you didn't have to do that. You certainly did not have to do that. So, I mean, I always really, really appreciated you Thank trying you. to send me a, a lifeline. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's scary. Cause like wrestling commentaries, unlike anything else. And it's why, you know, I've, you know, since leaving WWE, I am committed to working in the sports world and in the entertainment world at large. So when I'm having these conversations with a variety of networks, it's been like, oh, what can you do? I'm like, I can do anything. And it's not ego saying that that's just confidence because of what WWE and professional wrestling asks you to do in a broadcast. I always refer to it as like a boulder rolling downhill is that you're constantly trying to get out of the way of the boulder of like Indiana <laughs> yeah. Jones. Yeah. And if you don't hit something at the appropriate time, the moment is gone. It is live narration and voice acting. It is unlike anything else. And then mm -hmm. for us, for a lot of different things to be intentionally late to something, even though we already know about it. Like there's so many little facets to it that are really terrifying when you're in the moment and you just want to hit it right. And then I mentioned voice acting. So much of it is just freaking acting where it's like, yeah. you know, the guy's going to get hit with a steel chair, but you've got to be, oh, my God, he got hit with a steel chair, you know? So it's, it's really scary. So I understand the feeling and I hate to see anybody else in that situation and being like, what do I do? And it's like, all right, <laughs> let's my, help him I'm out. waving my arms, help me. <laughs> Come pick me up. Uh, no, but it, I mean, it is, it, it really is such an interesting world. And I mean, I feel like you could dissect doing commentary for wrestling. I mean, I feel like I could for forever. It's one I just, I still think about it. I've not done it in so long. And when I watch shows, I still think about it. And it's not even something that like, you know, I was not necessarily as passionate about it, but I, I always want to be good at the things that I do. So I'm always like, wait, I'm still trying to figure you, it out. You not were that committed I, to it, even though it was like clearly not necessarily something that you were uh, like trained to do or even like really yeah. 
terribly interested in doing it, to be frank. I, I I think there was room for you to grow there and actually become somebody really, really good on I think so color too. commentary. And I think I, I think about what Beth Phoenix was able to accomplish on NXT and just because that setting yeah. allowed her the time to grow and develop. Absolutely. What Beth Phoenix became as a commentator, I absolutely was like, yeah, Renee Paquette absolutely could have done the same thing. Yeah. It's just it's just a matter of setting sometimes. And there were a lot of instances where you and I would see it and it's like, that might not be the right platform or something. And they just need sure. a little bit more time to cook yeah. or something like that, so to speak. So that's just wrestling. That, that happens all the time. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, yeah, it's funny. I mean, it's such, it's such like, let's talk about like some of your stuff through WWE. I mean, we talked about us starting at the same time and, you know, you got to go on, you've called Raw, you've called SmackDown, you've called pay-per-views, you've called WrestleManias, you've done all these things, but you did have some different ups and downs while in WWE. What was that like going through some of those moments of doing shows, coming off of shows, moving on to other things that can be um, a bit of a, a mind f I would say. There were there were definitely frustrations, but there were so many high points when those opportunities would come up. Um, like I'd been I'd, I'd been put on SmackDown in 2014. I think I'm the youngest lead play by play announcer in the history of SmackDown. I didn't know what I was doing. Had no idea. Like that run of whatever briefly, however it was on SmackDown with like Cole and JBL. I, I hear that stuff every once in a while. I was like, that was terrible. I needed to come off that show. So in the moment, you're a kid. And I was naive. And I was like, oh, yeah. I, I'm a little frustrated by this. But in retrospect, all the changes that occurred, I understood why they happened. And then for things to pop up, you know, uh, last minute being the play-by-play -play guy for SmackDown for WrestleMania 33 in Orlando, I was like, I think like two, three weeks before the show, Cole told me, he's like, you're calling WrestleMania. And I was like, oh, really? All right, cool, man. You know? <laughs> looking forward to it so it's like just don't mess up so I, I think it's it's so normal again it's just it's just the world of professional wrestling and I even experienced it last night at Hard to Kill is that rarely are there moments where you feel a hundred percent prepared mm -hmm. and that's the beauty of it you just get thrown in the deep end and you got to see if you swim how do you prepare because I would always see you putting your notes together you've got your iPad you you are a very organized person you are like very type super a. OCD oh super my god OCD. <laughs> what goes into your prep it was it was very different obviously with WWE just because you have so many live traffic elements that you have to deal with as a play-by-play -play announcer and that I took a lot of pride in making sure I'm like, I've got the ads right. I've got the B-roll you know, set. I've watched all the packages. I know all my lead-ins, all that stuff. I just wanted all the traffic, as we refer to it, to be really clean. And I prided myself on that. And then secondary after that was making sure, okay, I get my partners involved, Graves and Byron there for a while. And then kind of third was calling the match because you almost have to treat that as like a reflex. So once like over years of working on it, that became a reflex. I found I was taking less and less notes about the match itself, like maybe one or two little things here and there. And you just memorize certain things in terms of how many times a guy's been champion or where he did it, et cetera. Mm. Um, Impact was very different because obviously I've not been calling it for years. So I had been watching it for a number of years. I watched a fair amount of the TNA days and then when it transitioned into TNA Impact and now just Impact Wrestling. So I'm, I've am i been a big fan of Impact stuff for a while. So it's just a matter of kind of, hitting the refresh button, so to speak, mm -hmm. and then just mm -hmm. doing a lot of notes. Like this was the most notes I've done for a show in a long time. <laughs> and it can be, it's funny. Like, I feel like, yeah, you write, you put together all these notes, but how often do you actually reference them during a show? Pretty often. Um, oh, you do. Good yeah. Pretty you. often. Yeah. Like last night I had a lot of things that I wanted to say, um, like the, the women getting to bookend the show is really cool. And then starting with the first, uh, women's, uh, ultimate X match. The thing that and I've spoken to Beth about this a lot of times is that the purpose of these firsts is that they become commonplace yeah. and that we don't have first time ever's anymore for anything in that it is equality and it is opportunity. And that's been very important. And it's just a matter of making sure that is the message. So I, I, there are a handful of things that I really wanted to get across. And then also just blurring those lines a little bit of like guys like you know Jonah and Macklin and even Madman Fulton who I got to call in the countdown to, to hard to kill it was like okay I've known these guys for a handful of years so it's like okay how can I kind of massage this a little bit and talk about some things W Morrissey's path 
we all saw By the, way, the rise how shredded and fall. was he for that Good it's God. really yeah it's really intimidating uh he's very huge and he's in great shape and uh he seems to be doing well which is awesome i but... texted him after i'm like excuse you look mm -hmm. at you you're shredded yeah. good he's, for him but like you and i saw how you know uh Cass and enzo rose and then uh you know unfortunately uh Cass was released and like a lot of people and, and he had to change a lot of things in his life yeah. and, and he did oh my he god seems did to he be ever... doing well he's changed a lot he's somebody i need to have him on this show actually because i yeah I, I would love to tell more of his story i know he's done some podcasts and he's he's talked about stuff and he's been pretty open about um his, his journey and his struggles and whatnot but it's really cool to see him doing so well it's awesome yeah. and they and they had a great match as well so I, and uh, moose i met once uh, at a bar somewhere in Orlando or whatever. So like, and he's gotten himself into ridiculous shape as well. And has really come a long way as a performer. I've watched him over the years. So like part of this is, Oh, guys, I know and have known. And then it's other guys where I'm like, I really wanted to call Trey Miguel stuff. I really wanted to call Josh Alexander stuff. And yeah. Moose has really transformed himself. Deanna Perrazzo. So it's, 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 last night was just fun. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. Roses are red, violets are blue. We love shaved balls. How about you? <laughs> Valentine's Day is coming and we know just the gift to give that special someone and really on any special occasion. This V-Day, it is time to give him a gift that four million men trusted worldwide from Manscaped, the leader in below the waist grooming. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, okay, so you guys can use my exclusive offer. Go to manscaped.com and use the promo code Renee, R-E-N-E-E, -E, and you get 20% off plus some free shipping. So hear me out. I mean, maybe you dropped the ball at Christmas. Balls, uh, uh, maybe you dropped the ball at Christmas and maybe you didn't get your man the gift that he wants. Um, and this is where you can kind of pick up the slack. So with this package, um, they get the lawnmower 4.0. This is an electric trimmer that is waterproof, um, reduces nicks, um, and it works best on loose skin. Again, you know what I'm talking about. The fact that it's waterproof and they can take this into the shower is my favorite aspect about this because nothing drives me more crazy than just seeing hair all over the bathroom because then who's left with that? Me, I don't wanna be left with that. Also, there is uh, the ball toner. Who doesn't want toned balls? I feel like we're really moving into the future here with ball care and this is where we need to be. So guys, what you gotta do is go to manscaped.com and for our exclusive offer, you guys get 20% off plus free shipping with the code Renee. That's R-E-N-E-E. -E. His balls will thank you. You're welcome. So 20% off and free shipping. Use the code Renee at manscaped.com. That is 20% off. Use our code Renee, R-E-N-E-E -E, at manscaped.com. M-A-N-S-C-A-P-E-D.com. Get your balls right for Valentine's Day. Did you ever think that your career would be in professional wrestling? No, never. Um, you and I have talked about it in that, like when I graduated college, I was obviously trying to get into sports journalism, sports broadcasting, whatever. And a job lead came up for WWE. And I was like, oh, okay. And like, you know, I was like, I don't, I was like into the video games and I'd watched the show when I was a kid and stuff. So I was like, all right. I'm like, you know, like any guy out of college, I was like, I need a job. Like I remember applying to uh, the Billings Mustangs baseball team out in Montana wow. and oh getting to, like the second round of interviews. And then like a week later, the WWE job posting came up and I was like, might as well try that too. So, <laughs> <laughs> but like, I can't even, I can't even begin to describe how lucky I got 23 years old and uh, to be there for close to nine years and learn what I learned in that time. It's why I think that I can do anything. It's why I believe I can do anything. So I'm really excited, not just about what impact offers me in terms of the schedule is fantastic. It just gives me flexibility to do things like the podcast. And I'm already doing about Penn state football, a passion of mine and other things in sports. I'm desperately wanting to get a new voiceover work um, because I think I have a deep voice, so that might work, uh, <laughs> helps, <laughs> but yeah. I would love to do VO work for video games. Uh, TV, movies, anything like that. Like, there's just so many things that, that because of the WWE schedule, you understand why they're like, we need you available all the mm -hmm. time. So they take priority, and that's and it's, and a it's justifiable. Too. You get tired. You're you're working constantly. So even I need trying a, to like yeah. shoehorn things in is like, oh my gosh, am I gonna do this or do I need to like do my laundry and like eat a meal and take a nap? <laughs> but I was like, I I think I was definitely burned out by the time this past uh, this past May came around. Mm -hmm. So like to have six months away from wrestling was for the first couple of months, it was like, oh God, like, cause 
you know what it's like when you're in it, you have to watch every show every week. So there's like five or six live or, you know, taped whatever weekly shows in WWE that you're like, you have to know. And I'm glad that I was doing that because summer of 2020, I was on five out of six shows because of the pandemic and COVID protocols. So I was glad I was prepared like that. But I was also like, this is this is too much. This is burned out. I'm, I'm absolutely burned out. So to take six months to just remove myself for a minute was was really helpful. What are some of the, what are some of the biggest things you learned during those nine years? What are some things that you'll kind of take with you onto like any other job that you do? Cause I mean, I, I agree with you a hundred percent that like your time in WWE is um, it's, it's so valuable. I mean, you've really, I it's, it's a full education. I mean, from so many different standpoints, from a television standpoint, a performance standpoint um, to, to traveling around the world. Like I think I would f- crush it on, um, What's the show where they travel around the world and do all, all the different challenges and shit? Oh, I don't even know. What's but it I could called? see you on an Anthony Bourdain type day. show. Or, I mean, or <laughs> that. Or that. Oh, Amazing Race. Thanks, James. Yeah, oh, Amazing Race. Like, I feel like it's funny. John and I had that on the other day, and I'm like, dude, you and I would crush on this show. Um, but what, what are some of the like valuable things that you think you uh, take away from that time? Um, Michael Cole certainly impressed upon me just having like clean broadcast because I, I admire everything that he's able to do and just he never makes it seem like something's wrong with a broadcast he completely has control. So that was something I really tried to uh, get good at and I'm still working on as things go by in my career. Um, JBL taught me the value of people. And I, I, he taught me very early on, he was like, you need to get to know everybody, everybody on this crew. And some of the guys that I got closest with are not people that are on camera, people that, you know, uh, civilians have no idea who they are. And those were the guys that when the chips were down in the course of a show or something like that, had your back and would mm-hmm. support you if things were rough or something like who that. Who are your so, guys? Who were who are some of your guys that you're talking my best, about? My best friend is Tamario Thomas. Mm-hmm. That's my boy. Uh, I love T manager. so much. I miss that guy. I love uh. T. I what a beautiful T. man he is. I miss um, him so much. I love him. Uh, Ibby, uh, Tom Ibbotson. Uh, there, there were like a thousand Toms that worked at WWE, there so it was very lot. confusing. <laughs> um, but Ibby and I would just constantly mess with each other. Um, prof in, uh, the, in the production office or no, um, mm-hmm. T, uh, TV office, whatever the hell yeah, it was. T- yeah, yeah um just i can't uh, there are a million people but um just even like berkeley ottman um tony chimmel when he was still there um marty miller like the, just a Love million marty, people yeah. that that's like just supported you like marty especially looked out for me like from day one because we were just mm-hmm. flying out of the same airport we grew up in a similar zip code he was just like i got you like marty's <laughs> like a, marty's like an uncle to me yeah, so it's just you, you develop a family in this world. Like, you know what it's like, you're on the road and it's like that, that becomes your family. That's the not best. to, not to conjure up tears from you, but how, how hard is it being away from these people all the time now? I mean, we spend so much time, like you said, I mean, we're all, we spend more time with these people than we do our own families. And that was the thing that I found was really hard was removing myself from that and being like, Hey, career wise, I want to go do all these things. And I want to get the wheels in motion. And I have all these dreams and aspirations, but at the same time, I'm like, Oh my God, my people, like it's, yeah. it's crazy. It's, it really, um, it really threw me for a loop. It was like, that was one of the hardest things about it is like, I've been really overwhelmed by the reaction, uh, obviously when I was released and then to the point that I was announced for impact, like the reaction, just like, I, I don't understand it. And it was really cool, but like, cause I the, tweeted it. I gave you a little, I appreciate you there. doing that. Thank you. You have a billion <laughs> followers. So thank you for doing that. Um, but like, seriously, I was just, it, it just makes you appreciate all these people and to have that network, like reach out to you when things are good. And when things are bad, like I had plenty of people checking on me for Mm -hmm. months just to be like, how you doing? What's going on? What's happening in your life? You know, you see the game or something like that. So, uh, when, when I left, it was just like, oh, that doesn't mean you stop having a relationship with these people, but you understand the relationships that are the most valuable that you get from that. And Mm -hmm. that's not a knock against anybody, but, um, do you you remember Shane Wasserman? Yeah. The truck. Yeah. Shane Wasserman, and I've got to wear it on a podcast. He sent me a t-shirt for Christmas uh, because I had seen him one time. I'm a Pennsylvania guy. So he had a t-shirt on one time at an NXT taping that said, I miss Wegmans. And if you've ever been to a Wegmans supermarket, 
they're the freaking best. I used to work in one in State College, Pennsylvania. <laughs> so I was like, where did you get that t-shirt? So he reached out to me when I got released. And then he sent me this t-shirt like out of the blue. Like I get a package that says Wasserman, Minnesota. And I was like, <laughs> do I know somebody in Minnesota? And I open it up. I'm like, oh my God. Like it was just so thoughtful. So oh, it's um, so funny. It's just, it's just so nice to have that network of people. And then uh, I find as I get older that relationships are about effort. And I, I try to put in a lot of effort with the people that are super important to me. And uh, I find you get that back. Yeah, absolutely. No, you're right. It, it's funny realizing how much work actually does go into a relationship. And like time goes by fast. Like I find myself, sometimes I feel like I'm drowning or I'm like taking care of my baby and I'm doing this thing. I'm doing this thing. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't want to like let these relationships slip between the cracks. And all of a sudden, I was gonna say, like, yeah, it's the last time you and I saw each other regularly, you were sans baby. Yeah. So I cannot imagine how your life has changed and how you try to balance all of that. Oh, I have no idea. I don't know. It's a lot of iced coffee. <laughs> it's a lot of iced coffee, um, naps when you can get them. But yeah, it's, it's crazy. I mean, like, it's just, it's interesting just when like life changes and you pivot and like things just start to look a little bit different and doing the same thing for the last eight, nine years. And it was great. There was, you know, there's the ups and the downs with everything, but that's just how your life is at that time. And now that it's not, and it's like this new thing, it's, it's just so funny. I find coming up for like a breath of fresh air and being like, Hey, who am I now? What do I do? Like, it's, it's just such a different perspective. I find the um, NHL network thing working out for you, by the way. Cause I was so, I, I was like, finally, like, <laughs> I know, no, it's really fun. It's cool. Like it's fun being able to do it. And I get to do it right from here. I get to do it from home. Um, so that's awesome. As much as like, let me tell you, like I do really, I miss going out and I miss being in a studio, honestly, on the superficial side. I just want to go through hair and makeup once uh, in a blue moon. <laughs> Where, like I do miss sort of like the showmanship that comes with doing television, but yeah. I love that I can work from home. And I love that. Like, I can just like leave my daughter downstairs for like an hour, pop up, do some work, go back down. Um, so NHL network, um, is one of those great things that's just been added into like the weekly routine of, I get to pop in, hang out with Jackie Redmond, which is like so funny She's that so her good. and I get to do this together. She's so great. She's so talented. Um, and I've known her literally since the very, very, very beginning of her career when she didn't even have a job in television. Um, well, because she came in and did um, a reality show. Um, mm -hmm. for I remember you and I talking about her years ago, and I think yeah. we'd been at a show in Canada, and I went back to the room and I saw her on uh, some, I guess, Sports Centra or something. I don't, I can't remember what the show was. Uh, I was it would like, have been, yeah, Sports Center oh, or um, uh, Raw. It would have been like Roger Sportsnet, something like that. that. Yeah. And and she was really good. And you're like, oh yeah, I know that girl. I was like, that's amazing. Like she was really really talented. It's cool to see her wind up in WWE now. Yeah. So it's so funny that like now I'm not there and she's there and now like I'm jumping <laughs> on and doing like her NHL. Show. It's just so funny how things like that work. I mean, you really like it is a small world. Everyone kind of ends up running into oh, yeah. other people in like different aspects, or, like at different points in your life. And it's, it's just, it's really cool. It's funny to like, yeah, just to uh, observe it all. Um, okay. On the broadcasting side of things, mm -hmm. who do you watch? Who do you watch? Who do you listen to? What are, what are like your reference points for yourself or things that you like during a broadcast? Um, in terms of like professional wrestling or just like sports broadcasting as a whole, whatever your little heart makes a little <laughs> beat to, <laughs> um, obviously like in the pro wrestling world, uh, Michael Cole taught me an immense amount. Like I can't even begin to put that into words. Michael. Um, uh, Michael, <laughs> uh, JBL, uh, Byron Graves, King, uh, a lot of people that influenced my, my work over the years. And then just in the conventional sports broadcasting world, like I, I think Joe Buck gets a lot of flack for some reason. I watch him do a show and I was like, he does perfect shows every single time. <laughs> so I love, I love listening to Joe Buck the way he executes. I think Mike Tirico is freaking unreal uh, for NBC. Um, I don't think I, I never get sick of Al Michaels. Like he's a dude who's just wildly talented. Dan Schulman at ESPN is super good. Um, there's just a lot of guys that I try and listen to little things that, you know, I feel like, oh, I would do that. I would do this. And now that it's just a little bit of a different environment for me, it's like, oh, maybe I can try and implement these things and just work on them for my own sake, even if they don't work for wrestling. It's like, okay, this is just a rep for me for yeah. some other opportunity down the line. Yeah. What was baby Tom like? What were you like as a kid? Small, I imagine. Really? <laughs> I was, um, I was, when I was a, a kid, I was really shy. 
Um, I was very, very nerdy. Um, I, I'm still nerdy, but um, I was just super shy and extraordinarily inquisitive to the point that like, I just didn't believe anything. I was like, well, why? Like, why are we doing this? Why are we going here? So um, yeah, I think, I don't know. I, I see a lot of things in terms of like, I, I still like showing up yesterday. I was like, oh, I don't want to make any assumptions that like, I know this person or like they like me or anything like that. And it's just, I get stuck up here mm -hmm. so often and it's just paralysis by analysis. So baby Tom was <laughs> paralysis um, by analysis. I like that. Yeah, but baby Tom was just a shy kid trying to fit in. <laughs> how did you overcome that? Like, how did you go from being a shy kid to being like, Oh, I want to be a broadcast. I'm going to be on TV. Like what, how'd you overcome that? I don't know if I ever really overcame the shyness and this is not a woe is me thing, but like I, I dealt with bullying as a kid. So I, Aww, I why? <laughs> so when I was in grade school, I, I was like the first kid to get acne. I was the first kid oh. to get braces as well. Oh, so no. a hell of a combination. <laughs> and um, I was getting made fun of. And I didn't understand at the time, like why. And I was just trying to make it stop. And then high school, I didn't really enjoy the experience just because I was like, OK, like I, I want to be liked. And I was playing sports. So I was like, oh, maybe I'm like one of the football guys. And it was like, eh, I wasn't fitting in there. And I was like, well, I don't want to be a nerd because I got made fun of made fun of for being like a nerd. And that didn't work either. So it was kind of a man without a country. And then I kind of found my people when I went to Penn State. And I still have a ton of close friends from there and really just kind of discovered who I am. And then it's only after college that I was like, OK, like it's OK to be just yourself and it's just okay to be a combination of it and mm -hmm. i think in wwe getting hired at 23 and seeing the way the culture was i was like okay this is a big deal i've got to be careful etc and now i just feel very very different and i'm like all right i'm 32 now i've experienced a lot um uh, i highly recommend to anybody to go through therapy and go through mental health uh exercises anything like that because it's just like what what kind, of, what kind of like exercises and like you've not always done therapy have you is this fairly new for you no this is within like the last like two years for me yeah, yeah. okay and what like what uh, so i don't do therapy and sometimes i'm like bitch go talk to somebody because I'm like, I'm like, my like eyes twitching and i'm like oh my god somebody help me but like how do you do you go see someone in person or is this like an on the phone? No, thing? That, what do you do? Like, like a lot of things with the pandemic, the silver lining is that you can do it virtually. So right. um, I, I'm very fortunate that like, it's just a vacuum to put things because you have so many people in your life where there's things you might want to say, but you know how it could affect the relationship. And it's maybe more important for you to oh, work I out be better at that. Oh it's, my maybe, God. it's maybe more important for you to work out how you feel and what to actually do in a situation than to just blurt it out or something like that. Like really take the time to filter mm, it. I can be, one. I can be very emotional. Like if something ticks me off in the moment, I really need to sleep on it, take a day. And then the next day kind of be like, okay, how do I feel about this? And wow, therapy's really helped me. You're work a better a lot. person than me. That I don't know about that, but <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm so bad for that. I will literally be like, yeah, don't say anything. Don't say anything. It's not a big deal. Don't say anything. Bam. And then it's right out of my mouth. I'm like, bitch, you're yeah. just telling yourself to not say anything. And it's like left my mouth and I can't take it back. I just, it's, it's a, yeah, that's one of my absolute biggest downfalls as a human being. Well, it's, it's, it's that, but it's also like it, the therapy is good, but it's also important to have a support system. Like, mm -hmm. Uh, our, our dear friend, Itor, uh, Biggie. Oh my God. Sweet man. Is one of my closest friends. And then like, if I'm dealing with something like I I'll text him or call him or, and vice versa. And just kind of be like, you know, I, I need to work this through or help me out with this. And it, he's been amazing. So I'm just thrilled that I have a lot of people like that in my life that I can call them, text them and just help me out. My family has been amazing. So it's just, I don't know. I think having that support system, then being able to really just flesh out how you're thinking and feeling and understand the reasons why something might be going on or how you're feeling. Sure. It's so valuable. What's um what's the dynamic of your family? It's just you and your brother, right? With obviously like your parents. No, so I I have a well, my older my brother's like three years older than me. I have a sister who's two years younger than me. Um, my parents are in Pennsylvania, so they're great. Um, we're really really close, all five of us. So uh, I'm really fortunate to have them. Uh, around pretty frequently my brother's based on the west coast right now he's in he's in the navy so mm -hmm. don't get to see him that often but uh yeah my family like we're really really close-knit um to the point that like christmas we see freaking everybody for christmas <laughs> yeah. and uh it's like okay it's like i was i was sitting there I was like i just gotta get through christmas because it's yeah. every family member i've ever seen oh my gosh yeah i feel like i've, I've not I've, I've met your brother 
I yes. think your brother's the only family. I don't think I've met your parents. I've definitely never met your sister. Yes. Um, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, my parents and my sister eventually came to some shows in I know Philadelphia. Your family, your, yeah, because your family was there when you got caked, right? Oh, God. <laughs> so, okay, let me, tell, let me tell you the story. So my sister went... Uh, my sister went to that show. So she's sitting close to hard camera. Right. And mm -hmm. she sees the cake thing happen and is like, what is going on? Like, I didn't know it was happening either. So of I was like, not. I was equally surprised. So I text her after the show. I was like, how do I get cake out of a suit? And she was like, I don't have the answer to that. <laughs> so I had to throw my suit in a trash bag, which we were in Philadelphia, of course. So it was like, hopefully, thankfully, right down the road for me. And uh, I threw it in a trash bag. But like, I didn't come to the arena with a change of clothes. So I had to borrow like basketball shorts and an undershirt from somebody just so I could walk to the parking lot, not in my underwear. And then coming home with a suit caked in a trash bag and going to a dry cleaner and being like, please help me. <laughs> so my sister got to see that. One of my Did favorites. Did you get it out? Did yeah, oh, yeah, I got it out. out. <laughs> yeah, I got it out. But one of my favorite experiences, like whenever my family would come, you know how it is with, with WWE is that if there's seats open right behind the announce desk, they try and fill that in just because it looks better on camera. Uh -huh. So my mom, my dad, my uh, sister and my brother, I think all five, uh, all four of them came and they were literally like three rows behind me to the point that I could just turn right around and they're right there. My dad is still texting me as the show is going on. And this is what, where New Day was throwing pancakes a lot. So he's like, can you grab a pancake from Biggie? I'm like, dad, you don't want these pancakes. Like you, no, you don't you want don't. them. And then like, he's texting me. He was like, we're behind you. I'm like, I know you're behind me. And I turn around, there's my dad <laughs> waving. And it was like, oh, there's nothing better. <laughs> ah, that's amazing. Um, what was your relationship with Vince like? Um, very professional. Um, I, I know a lot of people wanted to make sure that they were like, really close friends with him or something like that. I just always treated everything like, okay, you, you tell me what you want me to do and I'll go do it period. Like, and I just left it at that. So I, I, I always felt it was very professional. Uh, and we understood each other. If he fed me something, he fed me something, but like, I, I just tried to keep it simple that way. My, my yeah. dad, um, my dad was a Marine. So when I grew up, he always taught me the value of being like, go to work, do your job and do whatever they ask you to do. So for some reason you I saying your dad personally. was a Marine. I just got like a better scope of you as a person. I, I like <laughs> see it. That's great. I did not yeah. know that. I knew your brother um, served, but I did not know your dad as well. Yeah. I mean, my dad's a big marshmallow now, but like, <laughs> yeah, there's definitely the military background. And then my family's like Irish Catholic slash Italian. So you've got all those <laughs> vibes going on uh -huh. at the same time. So there's tons of good food at Christmas. And then we're, we're really good at the, uh, the, the Catholic guilt sort of, sort of stuff. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Um, okay. So you're at impact. Now you've had this great career at WWE. You've literally got to do just about everything there. Was there anything at WWE that you wish you got to do that you didn't do? Other than be the, did it all. I, I got to call main event of WrestleMania and whether or not that happened in the performance center in front of no crowd doesn't matter to me. It was the main event of night two of WrestleMania, whatever number WrestleMania that was. Um, <laughs> I got to be the the senior manager of on-air announced talent, a role you were, that I never... You were technically my boss, right? Sort of, yeah, which is super weird. <laughs> I, was like, I don't think I was a very good employee for you. I feel like... I, I think you were great. I think, <laughs> I think you were great. No, I, I honestly, like other than getting to be the guy in WWE uh, as the play-by-play -play voice, um, that that's the only thing. But honestly, I did everything, every show, every opportunity I got to do. And I did that all by the age of 32. So in my mind, I'm wow. really content with That's everything crazy. that I did in WWE. And now kind of what we talked about before, it's like, there's just different things that I can do here with impact and different yeah. things that I can do just in my career as a whole. And I can pursue a lot of different passions now. So I'm thrilled about it. What is at the tippy top of those passions aside from obviously landing like a great gig with somebody like impact, like you said, doing some of these voiceovers and different aspirations, whether it's in like another sport or whatever, what is like your tippy top thing that you want to do? I I'm a college football junkie. Uh, I love football. Um, big fan of NBA basketball, NFL, uh, you name it. Literally. I'm the guy who watches uh, in terms of football, like I'll watch the NFL, college football, the CFL, the XFL, wow. the USFL, like wow. I, will, I will be watching the USFL. So like, I'm, I'm obsessed and I love getting to do that because like 
to me, football is this really cool thing where tiny corners of the country or, you know, the continent basically get to be king for one day. So like I have this dream of going on the road and like visiting different, um, uh, visiting different stadiums and experiencing different cultures, et cetera, whether it be pro teams or college teams, whatever. Um, and that, whether that be doing that as a play-by-play announcer, a host, a sideline reporter, or hosting a show of some kind, um, that really, really intrigues me. And I think I can do that for a lot of things, but tweet that just... out. You gotta be manifesting this shit, Tom. I didn't know <laughs> that about you. Let people know and maybe you'll get hired. You know, he, he's telling me that all the time. He's like, you got to manifest the stuff you want. And you're like, I, yes. I just, I just never know what to say or tweet or put out there or something like that. So I'm like, Oh, okay. If it's something obvious. Like I work for impact now. And then other than that, I'm just like, I had, you know, chocolate cake today. Like that's all I can think to say. I, I have like no you should idea be like what to put tweeting out there. During these games and like tag these people tag them. I know. In. I know. I'm, I'll be better about that. You got, I, I mean, I say, say that, that it works very... out. I, I've not got my hallmark job. Um, and I've been trying that for years. So I mean, which is ridiculous, some, agree. which is ridiculous because the I amount agree. of Hallmark Christmas movies, whatever they are that are out there, they Can should be one? able to call you one. Can you give me one, mm-hmm. one that's selfish back to Toronto for Christmas. Part one, yes, part two, fine. part three. Yeah, please. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. I would love nothing more. I would love that. Um, okay. And finally, who do you really want to work with? If you could form your dream broadcast team, whether it was in professional wrestling or in something else, what would, you, what would that look like for you? I think right now, um, a, a guy that both you and I know, uh, Kazim Famiyude, uh, Kaz, um, Great he guy. and I have been friends for a very long time, uh, since our uh, time in WWE, uh, he and I got to do, um, CBS radio together back in August. So like he and I are constantly talking about different things and just we're, we're, we're friends. So I would kill to work with him. Uh, I've made a lot of uh, really good friendships within the industry of just like sports broadcasting as a whole. I'm working with some friends of mine from college right now. So um, Kaz jumps to mind, but uh, there's a I lot of that. guys. Kaz is the shit. You know, why Kaz, Kaz gets his flowers because he's on the show real soon. I just did an interview oh, with him. So uh, nice. Kaz is in the ether right now. He's doing it. He's, <laughs> he, he's in I, people. Yeah, he's at the, the college football playoff national championship as we speak. And I was like, this is crazy. And I think he feels the <laughs> same way, too. Yeah. But yeah, there's a, there's a million different people that I think would be really cool to work with. But like I've I can say that having conversations with all the major networks, it's just a matter of time, in my opinion. And mm-hmm. I'm really excited for whenever I can get a foot in the door because I want to prove whoever that is right. I have an enormous chip on my shoulder. And this is uh, this is my opportunity to prove what I've been thinking and saying for a very long time. And uh, I can't wait to do it. Yeah, I mean, I can I can definitely echo and back you up on that, that I know just how talented you are. I know what you bring to the table. And Thank honestly, you. like anyone that hired you would be blown away at the job that you would do. Um, you would Stop just it. knock it. Truly, though, you would Stop knock it out of the park. Um, and I, I think that that, again, is like it's definitely a testament to to all the work that you've put in over the last, you know, almost decade, you've put in work and you've been put in just about every possible situation. Um, so it's nice to be at a point where you're like pretty unflappable. You're like, bring it, throw anything my way. Let's go. I was not finished. I was just getting warmed up yes. and I can do anything. I, I deep down believe that in my heart. So yeah. I, thank you for saying all that. And I'm ready to go to work. Yay. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited <laughs> for you. Truly thank I you. am. I love seeing people like just you know, it's, it's time. It was time to move on to the next thing. And that's where you're at now when you're on that next thing and it started, you're in it. Um, and it's, it's really exciting for me to, to watch as a friend of yours, to see what you're, what you're going to do. And you get to just do it as you right now. And it's, it's really, really cool. So I'm so happy for you. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for breaking the news. Everything. You're the best. I I love you desperately. You're a wonderful friend. You're the best. It was so nice to have you on here. And, uh, yeah, I'll just be, I'll be watching and seeing you do more things. And I'm sure at some point we'll get to work together on something again, whatever that may just be. Just to I don't see know each other in knows. person again yeah. would be super cool. I don't have any need to go to Cincinnati right now, but like maybe <laughs> at some point. I mean, we'll our see. football teams are pretty good. Maybe you should think about that's that for true. a second. That's true. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> maybe we'll in the see what Bowl. happens. <laughs> All right, Tom, go uh, just tell everyone at Impact I said hello and kick ass. Yeah, come by anytime. I will.